great place to start, amen? Good morning, good morning. I tell you, it's as hot as it's been. I thought about preaching on hell. Just, <laughs> just kind of stay with the theme, you know? But we'll not do that today. In fact, I want to talk to you about restoration ministry that we all have in the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in regard to how to restore a brother in Christ Jesus. We'll be looking in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, about five verses we're going to focus on there this morning to talk about the importance of the ministry that we have as Christians. All too often, too many Christians fall beside the way and they're left there and they're not collected, amen, by meaning collected. I mean, we don't go to them, we don't help them. Someone said, Christians are the only army in the world that buries their wounded. The last thing we want to do is bury them, amen. And if you have, let's pray for a resurrection real quick. But Galatians chapter 6, let's look at this passage together. <clears throat> Verses 1 through 5 says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one more drink of water first. Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one <clears throat> in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each man, each person examine their own work, and then he will have a reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one shall bear his own load. In fact, the word load there is the same word up in verse 2 for burden. Everybody's going to bear their own burden. But uh, there's a different context tied to each one, and we'll look at that in just a moment. Three points I want to make, and of course, you know me, there'll always be a few sub points under those three points as we talk today <clears throat> on the importance of restoration and the ministry of restoration, restoring brothers that we have. The first point is, the, is that ministry and what we're called to and what it means for you as a Christian. The second part is the, the manner in which we bring a restoration about. The importance not only of doing it, but how we do it is equally important. The third part I want to bring out today is the ministers and what God says to you and to me if we're going to fulfill that particular ministry of restoration. So let's look at the first point. I'll get my throat back here in just a minute. The ministry of restoration. <clears throat> I think one of the most significant ministries that we in the church have, obviously, is the ministry of evangelism. We've been called to be soul winners. We're called to reach a lost world. Amen. If we're not doing that, then we're failing at the, at the greatest level, I believe, that every person who knows the Lord Jesus Christ has been given this ministry to reach out to people who do not know Jesus Christ and offer and share with them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to give them opportunities. Now, I, I really can't make anybody get saved any more than you can. Our responsibility is to, is to share that message, not to make them, but to preach the word, give them an opportunity. If we do that, we fail. I think many churches are committed to do that, but I think a secondary ministry, which is of a tremendous importance, Second to that ministry of evangelism is what I'm talking about today. The ministry of restoring brothers and sisters in Christ. The ministry of reaching to, out to people who've fallen beside the way and for whatever reason, and they can give you a lot by the way, but for whatever reason, we're out there seeking to bring them back to Christ and ultimately to the body of Christ. There's too many people. You, you come across them all the time, I do, who, who ask them about their relationship with the Lord. They may tell you, oh, I know the Lord. And then second question many times, well, where do you go to church? I don't go to church anymore. I just I don't go to church anymore. I, I, well, why not? Well, and it's usually one of two reasons. One is they've fallen out of fellowship with somebody in the church or, you know, there's some sin in their life uh, that, that's there in their life and they're just not walking with God anymore. No matter what it is, in fact, that passage is very clear in verse 1. It says, if any man is caught in any trespass, because it is a trespass not to restore with your brothers, right? Your sisters in the Lord. If they're caught in any trespass, then we have this ministry to restore those, if at all possible, any way we can. This word when he talks about restoring your brother, it is a Greek word which has to do with the, to, to set a broken limb. In other words, it's like a, a broken joint and it needs to be set properly or it won't restore properly. The idea is to set it so that it will completely be healed. That's the same mindset that God gives us in the Word of God. First of all, that we are a body, that we all make up the body of Christ. If you know Jesus, you're part 
of a body. If you say, well, I don't like organized religion, then take half of your New Testament and throw it in the trash. <laughs> Amen? Because half of the New Testament talks about the organism as well as the organization of that organism. It's a living body, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it talks about structure and it talks about order. In fact, it says do, do everything decently in order. And then lays out what the order of a New Testament church is. Talks about our goals, our motivation for reaching those goals. And so all that's given to us in the, in the scripture. So uh, usually there's something else besides a distaste for organized religion. Usually it's somebody is upset with somebody who was in the church and now they're no longer going to church. So what our goal is, is to reach out to people see that they are reset, restored, that the bones put back in place so there can be this healthy union and this healthy growth that takes place in their life. Now, the question is today as I share this is, is this any part of your spiritual life? Because it really needs to be a part. You need to be cognizant of the, of the necessity, the need to do this. Is this any part of your life? Do you feel any burden whatsoever that when you see people who are out of sync with the fellowship and with the brothers and the sisters in the Lord to help restore them? Well, this is not an optional thing when you, when you read it in Scripture. This is set down as a, a very straightforward command from the Lord Jesus. Hey, part of your walk is this. Not just to reach lost people, but part of your walk is to restore, you know, broken fellowship. I, listen, I believe if this became a real part of the church in America, not just to evangelize, but also to reach those who are falling out, we'd probably fill our churches tomorrow. You know, we really would. That the, because there's too many people that are believers that are laying aside the road somewhere, wounded and bleeding and needing restoration, sometimes by someone else's doing, they're, they're there for that reason, sometimes just by their own doing. But let's look at what the Bible has to say. And first of all is the importance of let's, let's fulfill this particular ministry. Let's reach out to people that are no longer in fellowship with the church. They need to be returned. They need to be back in restoration. They need to be back in the vitality of the body of Christ. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the manner. How do you go about that? If you really feel that we're supposed to be restoring people, well, there's two things that he mentions here. One is, is the attitude. He says, you approach them in the spirit of meekness, but also talks about an in, internal inward uh, position you need to take, that you need to be setting yourself. And he says, also consider yourself. One, in the spirit of meekness. <clears throat> Two, as you go, consider yourself. The spirit of meekness has to do with gentleness. It has to do with, you know, with, with an attitude that uh, you're going to walk in there with humility. You're not going with arrogance. You're not going with a, I'm better than you attitude, or you ought to be like me if you were spiritual, you'd come to my level. None of that's going to work. He says, you approach people with the spirit of meekness. Now, I think one of Bill Gothard's illustrations of this, if you ever went to one of those seminars back in the 80s that he did, he talked about meekness and he, and he shared the definition that it's basically, it's power and authority, it's power under control. And he used the illustration of a wild horse, you know, that hadn't been broken, hadn't been tamed, and how this horse has the ability, if you try to get on him or get in front of him, he may kill you. He has that kind of, he's so much stronger and so much bigger than you, all right? But when the horse is broken and he's bridled and he comes under control, then he demonstrates meekness. It's that, it's that all that authority is now brought into control. Well, that's our lives before Jesus. We submit our lives to him. He gives us his authority and we operate in an attitude of humility towards people who are fallen to people in sin. We, we don't go with an attitude of arrogance and superiority. He said, so you come with a spirit. In, in fact, he uses the word gentleness. Why do we need to be gentle? Well, have you ever had a broken bone and people aren't gentle with it? <laughs> you know, the, the extra pain that's incurred when there's no gentleness in dealing with it. He said, you know, you deal with it in this kind of attitude, this kind of spirit is the way you go. And this is where, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in just a moment, but this is where love really becomes critical in the heart and the life of a believer. We're not doing this just because we should do it. We're doing it because we genuinely care about people. Now, I've discovered that my care and my compassion for people is greatest when I'm most closely and deeply walking with Jesus in my own heart and life. That it's, that it's not natural to me to be that kind of caring person. Most of us aren't, we're more selfish than that. But when our hearts are right with God and our hearts are knit to Jesus's and we're being what God's called us to be, then he begins, well, the Bible says it in Romans five, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. God gives us that kind of love and that kind of compassion as we approach people with this kind of attitude and this kind of heart. He says, not only that, but consider yourself. Now, the first part of that is 
I'm considering myself in regard to, to the humility issue we just talked about. Will I, will I walk in humility? Will I be gentle? But part of that is also, when you go to them, you better have a gentle and a humble spirit because you could be there as well. You could be in the same situation. You're not as spiritual as we have a tendency to think that we are. In fact, you get just one little silly centimeter or less away from Jesus, you're capable of doing anything. I spoke with a young man on the phone a few weeks ago and he was telling about he was, he'd been out of church and I was going to say, what's going on? Why are you not in the fellowship? And he, he started saying, I've just, I've just failed. He said, I am so disappointed with myself. I have failed so miserably. He said, I've, I, I, I was just, I've made some real strong commitments in my life to the Lord recently and now I find myself dealing with some old sin that I hadn't dealt with for years. And he said, I just fell right in the middle of it and I blew it so big I'm just disappointed and I'm ashamed. And, and he said, I thought I was way past that. This is where the considering yourself comes in. <laughs> You're not way past that. You know? Our strength is not in our flesh and it's not in our moral resolve. Our strength is in the Lord. And as long as we're committing to him, as long as we're surrendering to him, we're safe. But if we think we've arrived and we don't really need the Lord today, you know, I may need him tomorrow, but I'm doing pretty good on my own. Then you're headed for trouble. That, this is an important posture as, as we seek to minister to people, because if we don't consider ourselves, you know, uh, then, then, then we most likely might end up in the same hole as, as, as they find their self in. Someone once said, sin is built in weakness with an opportunity to fail. <laughs> built in weakness with an opportunity to fail. And it's present as long as we're in this flesh. That's why the Bible says that's the importance of not walking after the flesh, but after the spirit. All right. So that we're pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. In first Corinthians, he gives this passage where he's talking about, he says, you know, the importance of, of, of the whole idea of, of considering yourself and, and not failing. He says, and he's talking about those in the past or those, their, their failures should serve as an example. But in, in the next verse, he said there, don't think that you he said, wherefore, let him think he stands, take heed lest he what? Lest he fall. He said, there's no temptation taking you, but such as common to man. But God will, with every temptation, make a way of escape. You, you may be able to, to bear it, to deal with it. In other words, you're going to be tempted. And most likely, as you seek to minister to somebody, you're getting ready to expose yourself to their failures. And you can be sure that Satan's going to use that opportunity to minister back to you. And to put that in your heart and to put that in your mind and to stir up your own mind in regard to that. He says, so you need to be aware of what you're heading to. You're, it's kind of like this. You need to be aware you're going to, to a war zone, you know. Put on your armor. Take heed. Because you're going into a situation to reach out to somebody and to pull them out of that thing. So don't think that you're beyond that. Don't think that you're better than that. Because you too can fall into the same trap as they fell into. And if you don't think you can, then you're headed for deep trouble. In fact, the word when he says take heed, that's a Greek word which has to do with watching very carefully, like being on guard. I mean, Satan would love to pull you in the same trap, wouldn't he? The same thing you're going to help somebody else overcome and walk away from, you know, that, that, you know, that you'd fall into that. So when you go, I think part of this whole manner of restoration is this, this spirit of gentleness and considering yourself is an attitude, hey, I better be praying. And I better be praying over them as well as praying over me. And I better be watchful and paying attention to what is going on. Which leads us to this third part, which is the more lengthier part of the message here, is, is the method of restoration. If I'm going to restore somebody, Brother Joe, how do I do that? I have someone in my heart and mind. I know somebody that, that's, you know, that's just out and they're, they're not walking with God and they're not in church. And I know they love Jesus at one time. And, and even now they're, they're kind of trying to carry on a relationship with the Lord, but they're failing in that. And how, how do I do that? Well, there's a couple of things when he says in verses two and five, he says, we should bear one another's burdens. And he says, every man should bear his own burden. Verse five says, he talks about this burden that every man bears his own burden. That's a small load. That's, a, that's like a backpack kind of burden. We, we all have a burden. We all have to deal with things. We all, we all have to deal with the devil. We all have to deal with issues in, in regard to our, our spiritual life and putting up the fight. We, we all have to, we're all called to, 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 to be on, uh, on guard. We're all called to be a witness. We're all called to, to give. We're all called to forgive. In other words, so you, you've got things you're going to, you've got to bear a burden yourself. We all have responsibilities. But then he uses that word up in verse two and where it says load in verse five, perhaps in your translation, verse two talks about the word burden. And that word has to do with carrying a big weight, almost an oppressive weight. Now that kind of weight is brought on by sin. 
David the psalmist said, he said, when I didn't repent and I didn't confess, he said, my sin was over me like a heavy burden. It was like, you know, the guilt, the shame, the conscience, the guilty conscience, just, you know, just dealing with this, I'm bearing it. That's, that's what he's talking about here. In, in Psalms 51, David is, remember he's in that, in that prayer in Psalms 51 where he's, he's confessing his sin to God and the, the whole deal with Bathsheba and he's, he's broken hearted and he, he's laying it all before the Lord. Verse three, he said, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. The idea of that ever before me is like, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of what I did. I'm ashamed of how I, how could I, I'm ashamed of my failures. And I'm, I'm embarrassed over my, that's, that's the idea that he's talking about here with this part of this weight, this guilty conscience, you know. And, and you can be sure that Satan you know, loves to have you in that kind of position because when he's got you down there and you're in the dirt and you don't feel like you can get any lower, that's when he's standing there kicking dirt in your face. <laughs> How could you? You're so sorry. You know, you're worth, you call yourself a Christian, you know. That, that's, his, that's his method. That's a, you know, it's a, it, when you think you're as low as you can go, the devil shows up with a shovel. You know what I'm talking about? And wants to drag you along. He says, There's some, you're going to have brothers and sisters like that who are dealing with that kind of oppressiveness and that kind of heaviness in their life. You know? And he said, you need to understand that. So when you go with them, you're going, to be, you're going to be a part of this, of lifting that burden off them and taking it to the Lord and walking through this process. So this, the, the method is, is important. So in this method, I'm going to give you three do's and three don'ts. They're really just some basic insights that will, will help you if you really are wanting to fulfill this ministry or... or and many of you do fulfill this ministry that will continue to help you in that regard. The three do's are pretty simple. First of all, should be the obvious if you're going to restore your brother. Do, number one, is do love them. All right? This is an act of love. It's not an act of showing that you're, you're spiritual and you're religious. Or what. This is an act of compassion. I'm coming to you, brother, sister, whatever, because I love you. you know? And I, it's this unconditional love that we talked about in Romans 5 a while ago. It says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It, it's, this, it's the law of Christ, the Bible says. In, in, verse, in, in, in chapter 6, says, we so fulfill the law of Christ. In fact, in chapter 5, just before this, he's using the same mindset as in verse 14. The law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You will love your neighbor as yourself. Somebody said Moses had 10 laws, Jesus had one. Well, that's because Jesus fulfilled the 10. But his was love God and love each other. Love God, love each other. We often kind of lean to that and say, well, I'm going to love God, love God, love God, but we don't love each other. The way we really demonstrate we have love for one another is to go to some brother that's fallen, some person that's out of fellowship, some person that's just on the sidelines. It's imperative at this point. If this is really your heart to do this, the most imperative thing you can do is this number one rule. You've got to show them love. Doesn't mean you don't tell them the truth, but you do show them love. It's imperative they see that. Some people it's drugs, some people's divorce, some people's loss of jobs, it's broken homes. You know, people lose, you know, their 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 self-respect, they lose their dignity in some of these situations. They, they live in that mode where David was, I can't believe I did that, I'm so sorry, I'll never amount to anything. And it's all just coming in and they enter in to, a, to just like, a, it's like a dark cloud of despair and depression. And, and they put on a good show a lot of times. In fact, many times when they're there, you, you would think those people are just intent on staying there. <laughs> Because of the way they act, I try to reach out to them and they just reject me or they reject others or they push back. That's because when you get in those kind of modes, many times you don't feel that you deserve any help. So you reject any help. But that's that part of that uh, illogic of Satan, how he works in people's hearts and minds. You know, he didn't want them to see truth and to know truth. And so they get wrapped up in this little world of self-pity, you know, and, and it, it's a miserable way to live their life. So the important thing is here, we go to them, hey, it doesn't matter what you've done. You know, the cross is the reason, you know, for all that, that God's love heals all that. You can come to the cross. So you love them. Part of that is, it, it, it's kind of with this, if you have to take some time to hear them. And that means not just, you know, just to hear with ears, but to, to listen to them. Sometimes people say more with their body language than they do with their mouth, but you listen to what they have to say. Now, there's some things we don't listen to, and I'll tell you that in just a moment. But right now, sometimes people just need somebody who's going to listen to them. All right? Just take a moment and hear what I've got to say. Take a moment and listen to me. 
There's more that's, that's done many times in, in, in my own personal counseling that gets accomplished probably by taking a little more time to listen than to talk. It's amazing when you start listening to some of the things that people really open up and finally will say that needs to be said, that they need to say. So it's good to have ears to hear, all right? But you need to have, in that regard, there needs to be discernment in that. The third thing about, the third do is this, and this is so important, this is where a lot of people fail in this ministry, is you do have to tell them the truth. It's not a matter of just consoling and putting a Band-Aid on somebody's sorrow and, and, and patting them on the back and letting them cry on your shoulder. It goes beyond that. You're there for a reason. You have a ministry there. The goal of that ministry is restoration, to set that broken bone in place, to see, to see a healing take place in their life. And so part of that, and, and a big part of that is being willing to say, hey, I understand what you're telling me, but here's the truth. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what God tells us. Remember, it's only the truth that sets people free. All right. The worst thing that we could do in a situation when somebody is wrong is somehow sympathize with them. And I think part of this here of, of hearing and then telling is this issue of some people are really good at, at justifying their behavior. I mean, they can be sitting there high as a kite, stoned as they can be, and they've got a really good Bible excuse for being that way. They could be leaving, you know, the love of their life and have a really sound reason, as far as the mind goes, for doing what they're doing. All right? People have gotten very good. The Bible says we can justify any deed of the flesh, right? And, you know, one of Satan's favorite things is to give you Bible verses to do it with. You know, there's a good Bible verse and I've got a Bible verse. I can give with a Bible. It's kind of like the guy, you know, uh, with, with the wine we talked about last week. Well, it's in the Bible, you know. He's got, and it'll give you three or four verses. Jesus turned the water into wine. Yeah. It's like the lady got pulled over and she's been driving radically. And, the, you know, I think I told you about her. She was pulled over. The cop says, ma'am, have you been drinking? She says, no, sir, I haven't been drinking. He said, what's in your glass? She said, water. He said, can I see it? He said, ma'am, that's wine. She said, praise the Lord. He's done it again. So, <laughs> You come up with good reasons, good excuses, but people, you, you don't need to sympathize. This is not the issue in regard to being sympathetic with their excuse, all right? You can sympathize with them as an individual, all right? And this is, this is important because we're, we're accepting, you know, them. We're, we're, not, we're not accepting what they're doing, you know? God says something's wrong, then, then, then it's wrong. And it's only the truth that's going to change your life. This is, this is the important part of saying, hey, Here's what the Bible says. Here's what God says. If it's wrong, then it's wrong. But here's what I'm, no, no, no. Despite all this other incidences and all the other things and reasons you have for what you did, you have to understand it's still wrong. And it, here's not, not only that, is it wrong? God will forgive it. Do you want to be forgiven? Then God can forgive that. And if you do, then there needs to be this point of you're willing to own up to it. You're going to, to, you're going to admit it. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to confess it. You know, some, some of y'all grew up in, in the TV days of happy days, y'all, right? Remember the Fonz? Fonz could never say he was wrong. And it, it, it would always get back to part and say, and say well, were you wrong? He said, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, you just couldn't say the word even. There's a lot of people like that. They just won't come to a full admission of it because of all it means to them internally if they do because their estimation of themselves is far higher than it should be, all right? So it, it, if there's not this honesty, though, then there's not going to be healing. You shall know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. That's why I need to be in a church like Believer's Fellowship, where we have brothers and sisters that stand for truth, you know, where we have preachers and teachers and lift group leaders and deacons and elders, you know, and people that stand for the truth. They want the truth. They love the truth. I need to be around people like that. It holds us accountable one to another. All right? I, I don't need to be in some church where the preacher gets up and rubs Vaseline on, a, on my sin. So, well, it'll be better tomorrow. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, does it? Nothing comes from it. There's nothing healed. There's nothing changed. There's nothing restored. I need to be around the truth. You need to be around the truth. We ought to embrace the truth, not run from it. And I know this is not the popular day for truth, but it's the reality that we desperately need. When you're talking to these people and you're presenting truth, get down to the, to the truth. Yes, I, this is sin. This is what God says about it. Here's what the Bible says. How are you going to deal with that? Well, I could do one of two ways. I can reject it or I can receive it. If I receive it, it means I'm going to turn from it. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to reconcile with God. 
I'm going to confess my sin. I mean, 1 John 1, 9 ought to be written in your memory banks. You know, if we confess our sins, that God's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the verse that we cling to in our failure. Lord, I blew it. I messed up. Please forgive me. The truth means they got to come to that place. You can help them walk through, just as you know how to bring someone to the cross and lead them in prayer to receive Jesus. You can lead people in prayer of repentance. You know, you can help them in this process. But it also means, you know, that it, there's going to be some decisions. You have to be honest with them. You're going to be honest. Hey, buddy, you need to go back to your wife. You know? Or you, you need to put that down and turn away from that. Or you need to turn that off. Or you need to quit reading that. Just being honest with people. That's what changes lives and that's what makes the big difference in people's lives. You ask for God's forgiveness. Maybe it means you need to reconcile with somebody else. You restore your fellowship with the body of Christ. You share with them the importance of not just turning from something, but turning to someone and getting it right with that person and that individual. You know, we're just living in, in a day when people would rather just change addresses than to do the hard thing. They'd rather just change location than to do the hard thing. They'd rather change mates instead of do the hard thing. But if you're a believer, you don't get to take the easy way. And praise God, because the easy way always leads to destruction. You're called to a higher kind of standard. You're called to a higher kind of life. And so when you teach these people and talk to these people and minister to any of these people, you're being honest with them. Those are the do's. What are they? I'm going to love them. I'm going to listen, but I'm also going to tell them the truth. Now, let me give you the three don'ts that kind of parallel with that right there. Number one, this kind of goes with the last one. Don't justify their sin. Do not agree with them. If it's wrong, it's wrong. You can't say, I know it's wrong, but you need to understand that my situation was different because the because doesn't work. Well, they treated me like this and they said this about me and they, uh, no, no, no. You still do the right thing. You still Nothing justifies our failures, all right? We just, we, I blew it. I should have done the right thing. I didn't do the right thing. I should have done the hard thing. I didn't do it. I should have made the difficult choice. I didn't. I chose the easy way. I did what I wanted to do. I blew it. See, they come to that place, then real freedom starts coming in. But I want you to know, like I said before, you know, some people are really good at giving you excuses for why they do stuff. And you can't sit back and no matter how logical it starts seeming in your brain, you got to weigh it with the heart. You have to use discernment. You have to look at it with the point of wisdom. Where that, that's where insight comes. Where you see it from God's perspective, not from man's perspective. You can't sit back and say, well, I'd do that too. Well, you might say that, but you, you, know, you can't say, I, I'd be tempted to do that too. But I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing. No matter what it costs me in this regard. So, you know, don't justify. If it's wrong, you, you don't justify. You give them acceptance, but you don't give their sin acceptance and approval. All right. This is how we can minister to anybody and everybody. You know, I love that passage where Paul's talking to the church in Corinth. He says, you know, some of you were homosexuals and some of you were drug addicts and some of you were drunkards and some of you, well, drunkards and drug are the same word there. He says, some of, you were, some of you were fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals. And he made this long list and I'm thinking, Paul, boy, you, 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 you surround yourself with some great people. <laughs> That's how they... He could say to them, you were these things, but now you're in Christ. You were these things. Hey, somebody had to tell them. Somebody had to reach, somebody had to reach you. Somebody had to tell you, all right? And so we can't isolate ourselves. We insulate ourselves. We go into the world. We share with these people what their need is, and we don't accept what they do, but we accept them and say, listen, there's room at the cross for you if you'll come. So don't justify. The second don't is don't listen to slander. We said you need to listen to somebody, but you, you don't want to get to the point where you're listening to slander. People leave the church for one of two reasons in the Lord. One is, uh, this is for the most part, sometimes it might be some deal like the pastor's a heretic or something, you know, not preaching the truth anymore and the church won't respond and get rid of him. But in reality, for majority of the time, people leave for two reasons. One, they leave because they're upset with somebody in the fellowship. And they refused to re reconcile. All right. They just they, they the other is, and of course that is sin. But the other is there's some area of their life that they've given into, and they start getting out of fellowship and getting out of church and getting away from Christians because they're convicted, and so they get out. 
So that's the majority, all right, for the, for the reasons that people leave, leave church, all right? Now, there's other reasons, you know, they, they move. Okay, that's a good reason to leave the church if you, you know, it's a long way to come from Dallas, all right? <laughs> but in reality, it really gets down to these two things. And here's what happens. Many times when you go to talk to people, they start sharing their bitter experience. You can't listen to people. You can listen to so far and say, I left because of, that's fine. Well, here's what the Bible says with you. But let me tell you what they did. No, that's what I don't need. This is where I need to consider myself. This is where I need to stay with a spirit of humility. The Bible talks about in Ephesians, a root of bitterness springing up and defiling many, right? What happens is their bitterness, it's, it's, it's cancerous. All right? It's cancerous. And if you expose yourself to that, you could be opening the door for a lot of big problems in your own personal life. I mean, if it's against a brother in the church and that brother, they had a falling out and you go to this brother that's out of church now because of that and you start ministering to him, he just needs to know, hey, God's will is it for you to, bring, to have healing. There's gonna be offenses. There's gonna always be offenses in this world. There's always gonna be hurt feelings. There's always gonna be, there's always gonna be some, some disagreements. You're right. That's just part of living, folks. But what we do, we grow in those things. We use the opportunity for that failure, whether it was theirs or mine, to grow. We use the opportunity to go deeper. You know, uh, it, it, it's the same in marriage, is it not? If you have a successful marriage, there's disagreements. What do you do? Oh, we just leave. No, you restore. You deal with it. You reconcile. You, you take care of business. Amen. There's differences come. It's just, just, just part of life. You make up. In fact, I'll start a fight with Kathy just so we can make up. I know I'm in trouble like that. <laughs> the idea is here is that, that that's when we're, when are we most like Jesus? Seriously, when are we most like Jesus? When we're forgiving. Isn't that right? When we're, when we're, 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 we're sacrificing. When we're giving ourselves up, that's when we're most like Christ. So we come to them and we're not going to be a part of that element. We say, no, I, I, that's, that's something that, that happened between you guys and that's where you guys are going to take care of it. This is what the Bible says. You forgive your brother and you receive your brother. All right. You don't separate. You go back and you love him. You say, well, let's work this out. Let's, whatever it takes, we can get through this. Let's make this happen. Let's make this right. And we do the right thing. But the worst thing you can do is listen to the gossip and take up the offense. And this is, this, is, this is a difficult place here for a lot of people because they, want, they feel like they need to tell. But the Bible said, beware lest the root of bitterness spring up and defile you as well. So you just let them know, hey, it's God's will for restoration. The Bible says we are ministers of reconciliation. That just me and you, and no, it's me and everybody to be restored. Which brings me to the third element, the second part, which is the third, the second part of that is why people leave. Sometimes it's because of sin in their life. Don't let people get detailed with you about their sin. You're not the Catholic priest listening to the confessional. All right. You don't need to hear the dirty details. All right. Why? This is that part of considering yourself. You don't need to be drawn into it, especially if they're one of those great con artists kind of people who can justify everything they do wrong. You know, that might start working into your conscience and you might start getting polluted by that as well. You need to be cautious. You need to say, hey, if you've sinned, I don't want to know the details of it, but I want you to know God already knows the details of it and he's ready to hear your confession. You know, and you just need to go to him and say, Lord, you said if you, that you would forgive me. So I'm here to confess my sin to you. All right. I'm not there to hear anybody's confession. I, I'm, I, I, Jesus is the high priest. He's the one that forgives. He's the one that cleanses. I think that's partly what Paul was talking about in Ephesians when he's talking about the spirit filled life. And he said, let no man deceive you with vain words, empty words. But because these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Don't be partakers with them for you were used to be sometimes darkness, but now you're a light and the light of the Lord. Is so walk as children of light for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, rather reprove them. It's a shame to even speak about the things which are done of them in secret. What's talking about? So you don't know, you don't need to know the shameful details. So stay away from those. Lest you be polluted as well. You want to be a successful in this ministry of reaching people. Boy, the way that you can derail yourself real fast is start letting some details and let it, let it sink into your heart and let it defile you as well. The last part of this, as we said, was the ministers of, rest, uh, of restoration. You know, he puts it this way. You who are spiritual, you who are spiritual, restore them. In other words, if there's sin in your heart, you need to get rid of that. If you're somebody you're not right with, you need to get it right. God wants to use you. And what better way 
for you to be used and have your own heart right with God. It, it, it's a hard thing. Trust me, I know. It's a hard thing to get up here and preach about truth if I'm not walking in it. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's hard to deal with. And it's the same for you as well, isn't it? It's hard to say, you know, you, you know that there's area of betrayal in your life with the Lord, but you're sitting over here singing, I love you, Lord. Or I surrender all. Well, you know there's some part in your life. So he's saying here, you be spiritual. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm mature? Does that mean I'm perfect? That means I never felt. No, it doesn't mean those things. Spirituality, in fact, and maturity are two different things. Maturity takes time. Sacrifice, commitment, discipline to be a mature believer. But spirituality, the, the, the youngest of us can be spiritual because it, all it means, one, well, the Bible says you're either flesh or your spirit. One, it means I'm saved. I'm, I, I, I give my heart to Jesus. Two, I need to walk in that spirituality. It means that I'm turning from myself daily and turning to Jesus daily. All right? I'm, it's, I'm adjusting myself to the Holy Spirit or am I adjusting myself to my own flesh? Which one's it going to be? I'm dying to self and taking up the cross or not? And so the idea of spirituality is that your heart is in tune with the Lord and you're right with the Lord as much as you know how at this point in your life. Amen. Stay tuned. More may come tomorrow that he shows you. But for now, you know, you're walking with Jesus and you're being obedient to Christ. He said, that's who it is. That's, that, that's who does it. That's the ones who are going to go out with the power of God in their life. Those are the ones who are going to walk in the spirit of God in their life. They're the ones who are going to make the difference. So even as we're talking about this, maybe there's somebody on your heart and mind, even today that you're thinking about, you know, I, I, I see that person on the side. I, I need to give him a call or I need to go see him or I need to, I need to talk to him. I, I'm going to text him this afternoon and see if I can get in touch with him. Then do it. Do it. If the Lord is speaking to your heart about it, then it's obvious he wants you to do something about it. Do it while God is laying it on your heart. Do it while you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Be the person who goes out there and puts your arms around and says, hey, there's room for you in the fellowship. Let's get this right with God. Carry his burden. Bear his burden. Put him on your back if necessary. Bring him back with you. Carry him back with you. You know, God can use a lot of people after they've fallen. You look through scripture, I mean, Peter, Denied the Lord at the cross. But the Lord used him mightily. Look, there's, there's Moses, there's David. I mean, you, me. The Lord, the Lord uses people. And he uses people that have become broken in his presence to reach those other people who are just wounded and need to find grace in their life. There's a great illustration of this in, in, the, in the New Testament. As, early, as, as a young believer, early in my relationship with the Lord, I was reading through Acts and I came across this story in Acts 15 where, where Barnabas and Paul, y'all read that story, haven't you? Where, where they're having this disagreement. And, and, and the, the passage in, is in Acts chapter five. It goes like this. Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, and, but Paul thought that was not good to take with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia. And he went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between, this is between Paul and Barnabas, that they departed asunder from one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and he went to Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and departed another way, recommended by the brethren to the grace of God. What's he saying here? There was a meeting that took place. We're getting ready to go on a mission trip. Mission committee meeting gets together. Paul and Barnabas are in charge. They're putting together the mission team. All right. Oh, let's take so-and-so. Let's take, yeah, and so-and-so. Oh, well, let's bring him to, and Barnabas says, hey, let's bring John Mark. To which Paul says, no, he can't go. What he came with? Oh, he's a great guy. Loves the Lord. No, no, he can't go. What do you mean he can't go? Barnabas said, hey, he can go. I know this guy. He's got a testimony. Loves Jesus. Paul says, I know him too. And he failed me. We were on our way to Pamphylia and he left us there. And he abandoned the work. And he came back home. And the Bible says uh, the contention was so sharp between that we ended up with two mission trips. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. You know, you know, I've always, when I, when I first heard that, ah, but that was an interesting meeting to be in. It shows that Christians can have disagreements, right? But apparently down the road, the disagreement was resolved and restoration took place because you see Paul later while he's in prison and he's writing to Timothy. And he, as he writes to Timothy in chapter four, it says, it says, only Luke is with me here. Take Mark. And it's the same guy. Take John Mark. Bring him with you for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Well, what happened? I don't know, but obviously restoration happened. Obviously healing took place. Obviously something happens, whether it's by circumstance or situation, but this is obviously these guys had some point in history and time where restoration happened. 
forgiveness took place. Healing took place. And now they're still in pursuit of Jesus together. Hey, bring him with me. He's profitable. He'll be a blessing to the ministry. Bring him here. That's a little different from Acts. <laughs> I ain't taking him anywhere with me. But this is the power of the gospel. Yes. This is the power of Jesus in our life, is it not? This is what makes us mightier and stronger and more formidable for the demonic host of the world that are around us. When he sees our hearts united in Christ, it causes Satan to even tremble more. Let's be what God's called us to be. Take the opportunity. If you've got somebody in your heart and mind that you've been, and probably, you know, I just know the way that God works. You know, he probably already put somebody on your mind before you got here, you've been thinking about. All right. Let's go past perhaps even our personal offenses. We talk about the, you have to go sometimes, it's the person that's offended you and go out there and make an effort for restoration. See what God does. Even if it's just the first seeds to be planted, go plant those seeds. See what God does. A healing is a glorious, glorious thing when it's done God's way. Now, there's other issues the Bible talks about in dealing with these things, you know, and, and church discipline and those kind of areas that people don't respond and are living a life that's obviously contrary to the testimony of the church that the Bible talks about those things. But there are some people, you have to realize that, you know, they probably never were saved. All right, they just, and you say, what, what, do you, how, what if they won't be restored? Well, John says, you know, they went out from us because they were not of us. You know, there's going to be some like that. You know, the Bible talks about people who have a, a pretend Christianity and, and go through, remember the sower of the seeds, that, that parable said some spring up for a season, you know, and they rejoice, but then they, they disappear. There's some like that. But there's some also that have fallen by the wayside that are true believers. So we give everyone the opportunity. We don't write people off. We love people. We care about people. Catch this, I'll close with this. Jesus died for people, Amen. not just you. He died for people. Let's stand with our heads bowed this morning.